What is going on YouTube Nation? This is Dark Dividend. If you guys are new to my YouTube channel, make sure you subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss future videos. So I'm going to attack the pharmaceutical sector. There are some great dividend stocks to buy. I'm going to give you my top five. Some of them I don't own, but I plan on buying. Some of them are going to be wildcard stocks that I may buy. There are some really good pharmaceutical stocks out there, and they're not going down or not going up. They're very stagnant. They distribute a great dividend. And these are ones that are pretty popular among the dividend investing community. But I'm going to show you some of them that I plan on buying once I change my M1 finance portfolio to attack the pharmaceutical sector. Um, chances are these are going to be in my dividend portfolio. And I'm going to be able to reveal to you those right now. So the first stock I'm going to reveal is GlaxoSmithKline PLC. So this is a very popular stock. Uh, it's definitely in the pharmaceutical industry. This is a very nice vaccine stock. Um, they, reve they are revealed as one of the best dividend stocks out there on many websites. They distribute a great dividend. I'm going to show you uh, what type of products they offer for people because when you invest in pharmaceutical stocks, you got to understand certain products, they have to be in demand so that they make revenue. Um, for example, uh, Johnson & Johnson, you know, they sell Tylenol. They are kind of a juggernaut when they um, sell certain products. They just, they have Band-Aids, they have Tylenol. They sell a lot of products. So the first thing I'm going to go over is GlaxoSmithKline and what type of products they carry to show you why this stock I'm probably going to buy on my M1 finance dividend portfolio and start generating some passive income. So here are just some products that GlaxoSmithKline uh, have that are in demand. First of all, amoxicillin. Um, if you go to your doctor and you have an infection, um, whether it's a respiratory infection or, um, you know, sometimes even just an infection on your hand or so, they will prescribe amoxicillin. That's a very popular drug. Um, here's another medication with a lot of people that have COPD that are smokers. Advair is a very popular medication. That is to um, people that, or people that have asthma. That is a very popular stock that is sold. Another product, uh, Bactroban. So how many times have you had a uh, topical infection? They say put Bactroban on that. Um, that's a um, antibacterial medication that you put on for like skin cream. So if you have stitches or you get a cut, sometimes you'll go to the urgent care and they'll say put Bactroban on it. Very popular um, product out there. Uh, Brio is another medication if you have asthma or if you have COPD or if you have a flare up with exacerbations. That is a medication that they give patients either in the hospital or they give um, you know, that people take um, outpatient, uh, especially during the seasons, uh, you know, the flu season or during the um, seasons like in the fall or the uh, spring where people, you know, mold, pollen, dust, all that stuff. That's a very popular uh, medication. It's not very cheap either, but it's very effective. Uh, Septin's another um, antibiotic that's very popular that people um, get for um, infections. Uh, Coreg, Carvedilol, uh, this is a very popular medication that people get when they either get heart attack issues or they're put on um, core measures um, to with a low ejection fraction with their heart, which means like congestive heart failure. That's part of the core measures, and Coreg is a very popular medication that people are discharged with. It's not very expensive, but it is very high in demand all the time. So that is a medication that is very popular. Um, I'll go over maybe just one more uh, area. So Flonase, how many times have you been uh, discharged with a respiratory infection? Unfortunately, if people get uh, COVID-19 or they get a sinus infection, they'll get prescribed uh, Flowinase and Flovent's another popular medication that is given to people who have respiratory issues. So I'm going to go over its uh, dividend history real quick. Uh, another thing, you know what, let me cover uh, one more thing. So 
their vaccines are very, um, it's very interesting, like the certain vaccines that they have. Um, I'm going to tell you, I have pushed this on my medications, uh, I am or other um, instances in the hospital. Um, this one right here, I have uh, pushed and the meningitis uh, B, I have done that on a lot of patients, um, you know, who need that or um, in my nursing clinicals back in the day. So that's a very big one. Hepatitis A and B, that's another one. So they carry some pretty generic um, vaccines as well. So now I'm gonna jump to their dividend history. So here's what I like about the stock. It's not really jumping up or down, but it's a quarterly dividend and the PE ratio is 12.13. It's dividend yield is 5.69%. It's a very popular dividend stock among uh, the dividend investing communities, an annual dividend of $2 and um, 48 cents. So a 5.69 dividend yield with a stock that I showed you in the beginning is not, you know, beaten really the S&P or done well, but, you know, it, you're going to get a nice bang for your buck. It really isn't going to jump up or down. It's not really a good stock to have in your um, traditional or Roth IRA. I mean, you can, but really I'm all about the Benjamins and this is a stock that yields a nice dividend. Um, it's pretty much consistent. It goes up and down. It's kind of a scatter bomb, but you're going to get a nice bang for your buck. So that's one stock that I am, uh, chances are I'm going to buy in my um, dividend portfolio on M1 Finance once I go after the pharmaceutical sector. And I'm gonna reveal to you my next stock right now. So the next stock I would like to reveal is Pfizer. So we all know about Pfizer and how they've done recently with a vaccine, which they are doing a phenomenal job with the vaccine with mRNA technology. So them and Moderna are the two stocks that are really um, making a push and the research has done very well with this stock. So the thing about Pfizer is eventually, I'm, I'm gonna tell you this, eventually when herd immunity happens, COVID-19 is not gonna be as rapid fire or as crazy. And already there's gotta be a correlation with Pfizer and Moderna's vaccine to work. But Pfizer also carries a lot of other products uh, is I will reveal to you that are very popular in the market that people take pride on. And, uh, you know, because of these products, they're doing so well, it doesn't even matter if they didn't have a COVID vaccine, they're still going to generate revenue and they're still going to do very well. But recently the S&P is catching up to it, but it doesn't matter for me because as a dividend investor, I like what I see, $34.69, that's pretty damn good. So let's jump to their products real quick and then I'll jump to their dividend history. So I know I have posted previous um, videos on a lot of these products that Pfizer carries, but these are very popular uh, among the community, uh, the medical community that are given to patients. Um, another thing is um, they own like huge business with IV bags. So that's another thing, you know, I'm not gonna jump to that, but. You know, everybody needs normal saline. Everybody needs half normal saline. So they're a juggernaut with that. Another thing is the EpiPen. So EpiPens are not cheap. So if you're allergic to something, um, peanuts or something, you have to carry an EpiPen with you. Because if you get a reaction, boom, you need to auto inject that in yourself so that you don't get a serious reaction. Here's another few things with some of their products. Quinepril, which is an um, a, uh, ACE inhibitor. So anytime you see the word pril, um, you'll know that that's an ACE inhibitor that's used for people that have um, low ejection fractions or uh, cardiac um, congestive heart failure. So, you know, you get an echo done, sometimes they'll put, put you on an ACE inhibitor. And if you have a dry cough, they'll put you on an angiotensin receptor blocker. But the ACE inhibitor is really important because it helps with the whole process of the body basically uh, helping with the ejection fraction and following core measures. I don't want to go into serious uh, detail, but you know it's it's a very important med for people that have congestive heart failure. And unfortunately, the obesity rate in the United States is getting terrible, and it's just going to get up and go up because people don't they take care of themselves. Here's another uh, combination: quinepril, hydrochlorothiazide. Hydrochlorothiazide is a very 
common diuretic, a pee pill that they give to people who have um, congestive heart failure so that they don't get volume overloaded or fluid overloaded. So that's a very popular product. Next thing is acetylcysteine, which we call mucomist. It can go in two forms. One in IV form, it's an antidote uh, it's for uh, people that have uh, Tylenol overdose, but it's also a great medication for people in the hospital. Uh, they put on a mask and if you ever see or visit someone in the hospital, it smells like rotten eggs. Chances are acetylcysteine is being used in uh, vape form and um, it helps people with um, that uh, basically have like aspiration pneumonia. So it's been, it shows that it's very good with that. Next is adenosine. That we call this the adenosine challenge. So if people hit supraventricular tachycardia, we inject six milligrams. And if six milligrams don't work, we try 12 milligrams. This medication lasts in less than two seconds. The moment you inject it in someone, it hits the liver and detoxifies and uh, the half-life is very short. But we always tell our patients, you, you don't wanna tell your patients you, that it's gonna stop their heart for a second. So we just say, you're gonna feel funny, but sometimes it can correct people's supraventricular tachycardia, sometimes it doesn't. It doesn't work well for AFib, so I'm just letting you know. Aldactone is a very popular um, potassium sparing diuretic. So when you take medications like hydrochlorothiazide, uh, you can lose your sodium a lot and you can lose potassium and other electrolytes, but aldactone is a special diuretic. It holds on to potassium. So if potassium is too high or too low in someone, it can cause really weird ab uh, cardiac abnormalities. Uh, we call it dysrhythmias. Uh, another medication is amiodarone. It's an antiarrhythmic medication. So sometimes it'll help people from uh, having like dysrhythmias, basically what I was saying before. So that can last a long time in your system. And it's a very popular drug. It's used for um, ACLS protocols. We start with um, epinephrine, and then we try uh, 300 milligrams of amiodarone, and then we try 150. So it's also given to a lot of people that have um, pacemakers and, and other cardiac issues. Ampicillin and sulbactam is another popular antibiotic that's in IV form. Uh, ampicillin for injection, that's in a lot of urgent care. So if people get uh, infections, they just do an IM sometimes with them, or they just sometimes mix it in the bag. So um, let's just go over another one. Atropine, nasrithromycin, this is just some of them they carry. Atropine is a medication. If your heart rate is very low, uh, bradycardic, let's just say below 50 or so, we try atropine first to try to fix someone. And if it doesn't work, then we try to get them on a, um, you know, have a, a pacemaker mode on our um, monitor or defibrillator basically. And then we have to give them a pacemaker if their heart rate's uh, running low. Sometimes medications do, do, they like do too good of a job. So say like they're on a beta blocker and their heart rate's running really low or on cardizem, it's running really low, we try atropine. Another popular medication is azrithromycin. We call it the Z-Pack. A lot of people that have upper respiratory infections, they give them azrithromycin. Uh, it, it helps with pneumonia, it's a very popular product. So now I'm gonna jump to its dividend history real quick. And I do own Pfizer stock and I, and I am long in Pfizer stock. Okay, so the nice thing about Pfizer is, as you have seen since inception, let's just say 2011, they started distributing a dividend. It's quarterly dividend, started at 20 cents a share. Now it's up to 39 cents a share and has increased its dividend. Right now, the yield is about 4.4%, which is very nice. So you're looking at a stock that has increased its dividend over time. Price per share isn't really too exciting. So it's not really a stock that you would want in your traditional Roth IRA. So stock is a dividend investor. You like um, compounding the interest getting that nice quarterly dividend, either putting more money in or reinvesting the dividends with a drip uh, method. So that's a very nice stock that I like. Um, I have that in my M1 finance portfolio. Uh, I own a lot of shares in it and I am going to be long in Pfizer. I'm just letting you know. So let's jump to the next stock. So here's a popular stock that has not done well against the NSP, but it yields a very, nice dividend 
I can guarantee that this is going to be on my dividend portfolio, my M1 finance dividend portfolio, AVV. So this is what I like about this stock. It has not really done well against the S&P, as you can see, but it has fantastic products, which I will reveal to you and show you its dividend history, which is very attractive right now as a dividend investor. This is probably the most popular dividend stock other than Pfizer amongst the dividend investing community. This is one that you can't rule out. This is one that's like, it's, you know, the dividends are increasing. It's not that expensive. And it's something that you need to capitalize on. So let's go over their products real quick. So I'm just gonna go over a few of these medications that they carry, um, very popular ones that they're not going anywhere. Uh, Depakote, Depakote, excuse me, and Depakote ER. These are for people that have um, issues with um, seizures. And you can actually check people's lab levels for valproic acid to see if uh, it's um, basically therapeutic. And this also has a sprinkle capsule. So people that are um, having issues with like peg tubes or aspiration issues, that's going to be used for some of those people. Now, you can't really crush extended release um, pills, but this is a very popular product that if people see neurologists, they give this to people. Depakote sometimes is used for people that have mood issues as well, um, but it's more popular for people with seizures. So that's a very popular medication. Here's some uh, virology uh, medications, really in, uh, very popular ones. Uh, Kaletra, uh, Norvir, so this is for, um, these are basically anti-viral um, uh, uh, medications uh, that goes after that sector. Um, here's some generic ones. These are the ones that I really wanna go over. Um, Androgel, so this is uh, topical gel. So people now, um, especially guys, they are going to their physician to see what their testosterone levels are. And if it's not within range, they just take Androgel. So that's pretty popular. Unfortunately, uh, growth hormone uh, amongst the bodybuilding community is huge and um, people are will do whatever it takes to good, look good, unfortunately. But Androgel, when it's used appropriately, is um, it'll help people with their testosterone levels. So Creon is another medication. If you have digestive issues, you take Creon with um, your meals. Um, that's very popular. Um, if you don't take it, then you're going to have some digestive issues. So you have to pretty much take it for with uh, meals. Uh, let's go over some some basic ones. Synthroid. So look, come on, let's think about Synthroid. So Synthroid is people that have hypothyroidism. They're going to need to take Synthroid to get their um, levels uh, back to normal. So huge popular stock. That's <laughs> that's not going anywhere. It's cheap. You can check your lab levels basically to see if you're therapeutic. It's very nice. So uh, that's a really nice one. I, I just want to go over some basic medications, but this is probably one of the most popular medications out there for people with hypothyroidism. So let's jump to their dividend history. Look at this juggernaut row, 51 cents 2015, all the way up to 130 on um, January 14, 2021 with a 4.98% dividend yield. This stock is increasing its dividend yield. It's getting powerful. This is going to be the first stock that I buy. Them and GlaxoSmithKline in the pharmaceutical sector, I want to get a lot of shares in this stock because I know this is going to buy more shares of other stocks. And I'm going to hit this sector very hard. And this is going to be probably my primary stock once I build a um, portfolio era, area with um, AbbVie and the pharmaceutical area, this is going to be my like prize possession. I am not, I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna buy this stock, I'm gonna be long in this stock, and this ain't going anywhere. It's just gonna, it's just huge juggernaut company. Their dividend yield is very popular for dividend investors. This, in my honest opinion, this is the most popular pharmaceutical stock that dividend investors buy. A five five dollar and two cents uh, dividend yield, uh, five point two annual dividend yield. 
I'm sorry, $5.20 dividend yield. Price to earnings ratio, 36.43, almost 5% dividend yield, okay? And it's quarterly dividend. How can you say no to that? And I'm gonna jump to the next dividend stock. The next stock would be Gilead Sciences. Some people say Gilead uh, Sciences, but this is a very powerful stock that yields a, a nice dividend yield. It is very popular amongst the vaccine community. Uh, it is also carries some very nice generic products. So for $64.80, this is a stock that is on my radar. And I really like what these, uh, what their capabilities are as a dividend stock. And I'm very excited to um, look at this stock and study this stock to consider it my dividend portfolio. Um, it's not gonna be as big as AVI, but this is going to be um, on my radar. I might add that, because I think what I plan on doing, is adding five or six pharmaceutical stocks. Uh, AVI is gonna be my big one. I already have Pfizer. So I'm not, I can't complain about that. But this one is going to be on my radar. Um, GlaxoSmithKline will be added as well, but I want Avi to really start getting the, um, the dividends first and get the Benjamins. I want to at least get 10 or 20 before I start considering buying other stocks. But this one, I will show you the products that they carry and why they're such a juggernaut in the pharmaceutical uh, industry. So here's just some medications. They really pride themselves on the HIV and AIDS um, medications. Uh, these are really good for basically keeping the virus from getting crazy and aggressive. They have increased the longevity of people who are infected with HIV and AIDS. I also have some medications with liver diseases. These are really good ones to um, help people, well, not me, but them. And um, these are very popular products. I don't, you know, I don't want to get into crazy detail on them, but um, another thing that they are um, really good with is the cardiovascular side. Renexa is a very popular medication. Uh, Lexascan is another thing, like basically with uh, tests. That is a big one that they carry. They also pride themselves on, let's just do other medications. So I don't want to really want to go into crazy detail on that, but I'm going to show you what they're really good at is their vaccines. So I'm gonna jump to that. I think that's one of their biggest things. They're not like so big. I mean, they're big, but they're really, really powerful with the vaccine. So I'm gonna go over that real quick. So one thing that they are huge on, all right, here's another thing is remdesivir. So in the medical community, you know, people are a little wishy-washy. I know the World Health Organization is not, um, happy about, you know, with remdesivir, but this is approved by the FDA to treat people with COVID-19 in the United States. I'm going to be honest with you. I mean, I can't speak for, you know, I'm not um, a physician or pharmacist, but I have worked on COVID-19 units as a nurse, and this was a go-to medication. Um, I do believe that this is a medication that has helped people and reduced um, deaths with COVID-19. Again, you know, I don't, you know, I know some people say no, but I believe that it um, has worked. The FDA approved it. It is uh, based on data that has shortened recovery by five days in hospitalized COVID-19 patients. So this is data right here. This is fact checking data okay so you know that's the thing that's nice about this medication but I, i'm also going to jump on their vaccines i wanted to emphasize remdesivir that's a very popular medication used on the COVID 19 uh, pandemic this is the one that excites me and this is poss i mean you know we'll see what happens but this is what's exciting about uh these guys so they're pairing up 
with Gritstone for an HIV therapeutic vaccine. And they believe that there can be a, um, a cure for the disease. So they're going to run a phase one study of the vaccine, hold on to an option to obtain a exclusive license to work and sell the therapy, okay, after its early trial. So these guys, this is what's cool. So basically they're um, looking for the results, okay. So Gritstone was sparse from the details of HIV therapeutic ther uh, therapeutic and technology, but we know it taps with the SIV virus derived from antigens and monoantigens, which are very similar to HIV-1. The results were strong, durable, and broad anti-SIV CD8 T cell receptors. So the C um, Gilead Sciences Virology team have found some very interesting information. They pride themselves, uh, like I said, they pride themselves on and you know HIV and you know hepatitis C med medications. Okay, so these guys have done very well and they're a huge juggernaut when it comes to the um the race to find um a vaccine towards hiv and hiv slash aids and hepatitis c so the work that they're doing okay is very um it's very aggressive so as they say curing the hiv remains an ultimate aspiration by Gilead's uh, HIV research and development efforts, okay? So they are very close. I'm just letting you know that they, I know that they failed with remdesivir for Ebola, but they are extremely powerful with finding a potential vaccine for HIV, AIDS, and hepatitis C. So I'm gonna to jump to their dividend history real quick. Great thing about these guys is they have increased their dividend um, from 2018 to 2021, been very consistent, 4.07% dividend yield. They haven't really jumped up like crazy, but again, the price, an annual dividend $2.84. Okay, let's think about this though. Okay, quarterly dividend. Eight, you know, vaccine, they're, they're in the vaccine race for HIV, hepatitis C. I believe that they're um, one of the front runners, unless if Moderna or Pfizer with their mRNA technology goes after them. I just read a brief article of um, them priding themselves in the vaccine, but look at all those products they carry, the antiviral, I'm sorry, for HIV and hepatitis C. That's very much in demand and they are a juggernaut um, this is one stock that I'm probably going to get eventually, um, but I really want to get, um, you know, Abvi and these other ones. So it was, um, I tried to be as basic as possible with this one, um, but, you know, this is, they have some in-depth stuff. I don't want to like go crazy in the, the, the pharmacology and, and, and how they work, but that's just one popular stock. Um, thing that they uh, pride themselves on HIV and hepatitis C and their vaccine race that they have done. So I'm going to jump to my last stock, my last dividend stock. You probably never even heard of it, but it yields a very nice semi-annual dividend. And um, it's not too bad amongst the dividend investors. So let's jump to that one. That stock would be Takeda Pharmaceutical. So some people never even heard of this stock. It yields a 7 8 annual dividend, and it is the largest, okay, um, Medicaid, like, pharmaceutical company. It's one of the largest in Asia. So I'm going to jump to you uh, basically with, like, what these guys are about because people probably never even heard of them or saw their symbols. So let me just give a brief overview about this stock. So people really don't know who they are, but they're really originated in Tokyo, Japan. Here's their website if you have any inter uh, questions or, or um, interest in these guys. Um, so here's their, um, basically here's one of a, their symbols, TSE, okay? But the other one is TAK, 
And basically, let me show you some products they carry because that's what people want to know about pharmaceutical stocks and what they carry and why they're in demand. So here's some medications that they pride themselves on. The biggest one is protonics, I would say. Uh, and another one is probably over here, Colchris, but let's start with protonics. Uh, that is to help people with gastric acid uh, issues or GERD, gastroesophageal reflux disease. It's also given to people who take aspirin or Plavix. It's also used for ulcer prevention. So sometimes your physicians will, well, most of the time they should uh, give them like uh, Pepsid or, or uh, um, Protonics or a proton pump inhibitor um, to people that take uh, medications that are antiplatelets or anticoagulants. It helps reduce ulcer prevention. The research is there. Very popular um, product that uh, these guys carry and it's, and it's used worldwide. Another one is Colchris, real quick. That's for gout flares. So anybody that has um, gout flares, that is huge. And also people that have uh, familial Mediterranean fever, that's another one. But the really gout flares, I don't know if you know anyone that has gout, but if they don't take their Colchris, they're in big trouble. So that is a issue with a lot of people that have, um, you know, like issues with gout. Here's another one, uloric. That's also for people who have hyperuricema or uric acid. So if you have high levels, you're gonna get a gout flare up. That's almost guaranteed. So we're gonna to jump to the dividend history real quick. Price per share is very attractive. So that's what I really like about that stock is it's very cheap and it's not very expensive. So, you know, 28, 30, it's going up to 36. That's one that, you know, over time, it'll probably be very nice. So you know, it's a semi-annual dividend. So I'm just letting you know that, um, you know, it's twice a year. So that's one, if you wanna attack a certain month, you know, I wanna get uh, certain dividends in a certain month. Uh, that's something that, um, you know, that you might want to uh, consider if you wanna get paid in a certain month. So let me know what you think of this video. I know with, with uh, Gilead Sciences, I tried to be a little bit more basic and I tried to show you some stuff that they pride themselves with vaccines and HIV and hepatitis uh, C vaccines, but they are, they pride themselves in trying to find a vaccine. And if they are the winner in the vaccine, watch out. But again, as a dividend investor, these are five stocks that um, I really think are great pharmaceutical stocks to buy. Um, let me know what you think of this video. Again, if you are new to this channel, make sure you subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss future videos. This is Dark Dividend. Have a good one.